So in this lecture, I'd like to talk a bit about what happens when I start with a basic differential equation and try to work all the way through sort of some of the basic Laplace transform concepts that we often see in circuits. And so imagine that one starts with a very simple Laplace transform, sort of, or very simple differential equation that we want a Laplace transform. Start off with this very simple first order equation. Now you could probably imagine lots of places where something like this would come from. Potentially a very simple RC circuit would give you this kind of differential equation with an arbitrary uh, input function generation. So you look at this and you think, well, how do I solve it? Well, you basically end up solving it by transforming this down into a Laplace domain. Now, if you think about that for a minute, what you're going to basically be doing is really taking the heavy side concept of basically just taking the derivative, making it be s, and you get everything in s, and you think, oh, that's great. It's not just some a little bit of mathematical representation. You get sort of that your v of s, which is now going to be sort of the thing that's your state variable. Again, it's a single state variable because it's one derivative term. Is it going to end up give me 1 over st plus 1 times the input of s? And so this is all in s domain. Now we could have gotten this in different ways, but just kind of this is the differential equation we begin with. And then you say, well now what would happen with this differential equation if we did something like uh, just put in a step input? So imagine I have something that goes from 0 to 1 volt and u of t, so it goes right at t equal to 0. So that's what the core of this heavy side function would be. Great. So now the question we ask is, well, okay, the Laplace transform of that vn of s is just 1 over s, and you think, ah, oh, this will work well. So then I just get the product of these two terms. And then I just need to be able to then take this and then invert it somehow. Well, how am I going to invert it? Well, the easy way to invert this is then to say, well, let me now split this into two different fractions, 1 over s minus tau over 1 plus s tau. Again, this is a partial fraction expansion, and so you kind of, if you're not sure how to do that, you can kind of say, let me assume a for one and b for the other, and then solve it. Or you might also just be able to guess and find it. If you can find a solution, you have the solution. But you always want to make sure that you have the right solution. And so then my v of s is 1 over s minus 1 over s plus 1 over tau. The good part about that is then I can actually transform this back to a voltage, and this gives me u of t, and this gives me minus e to the minus t over tau, because the 1 over tau term over u of t, and then I get 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. Now, again, realize that this 1 over tau term is sort of 1 over a time term, but this kind of is a very, very critical concept, and we're going to keep seeing fractions like this everywhere. And they, these give me these running exponentials, and this turns out to be extremely valuable in terms of figuring it out. Another really interesting concept is that from the Laplace domain directly, if I was curious about two things, say, what is the initial value of the step, and then also what is the steady state value, I could actually find that by looking at the Laplace domain. If for some reason the differential equation was kind of difficult to figure it out. And what I can see for the initial step is that as I look at just what happens to t just after that step, so it's 0 plus if you want to think of it that way, is the same thing as looking at s going to infinity. And so this turns out to give you a really interesting option as you start looking at these different possibilities. So what you end up getting then is you say multiply s times the entire thing that we had for the thing that we're trying to look for. If I take the limit of this with s doing that, this is basically for s going to infinity will go to 0 the s and the 1 over s cancel out. This works pretty well. Now, if I want to look at it for t equal to infinity, again, the same thing, but now it's going to be s to 0. Again, the s is subtract out. I look when the s goes out. All I get is 1. This works out really well, and you're like, OK, great. So the sort of step response problem works well. Might have been one that you could have solved easily with differential equations, but maybe not, uh, you know, in terms of just sort of typical techniques. But a couple other things are interesting, and particularly sort of these two different cases, both a sinusoidal input as well as what would happen if I had a sort of decreasing exponential that sort of started at t equal to zero and then fell. And what you see in both of these cases is that exponentials, which could be either the e to the, you know, e to a t over tau term, or it could be a sine and cosine, which again are complex exponentials, those sort of core properties go through the differential equation because after all it's linear and so I need to be able, I will always have that to account for. In the case of a dying exponential what I'm going to have is that vn of s is then going to just be 1 over s plus a over tau. Well again I can now get a nice fraction 
I can look at, for example, I could look, look at the various limits, which is quite interesting to see that in this case, the limits for both cases get me to zero. And that's probably an interesting thing to think about with that equation. But what I then could say is like, let me take the entire V of S term, which is then, um, you know, basically gives me a one over S tau plus one and a one over S tau plus A term. And interestingly enough, I get two, I can kind of do a partial fraction expansion for the two of them. Taking that, bringing that, you know, kind of grouping things together just a little bit. So basically now I've got S over one plus one over tau and one over S plus A over tau. I can actually then get it into a straightforward form, grouping the one over A minus one out to the outside to give me sort of this difference of two exponentials, which is this original T over tau that we might have seen like in this case, but I also get this additional term due to the dying exponential in the input. So notice that that comes through. Any linear system, you're going to find that the exponential will come through the system. And then I will just have to see what does it happen in terms of is maybe its magnitude, maybe it gets time shifted, maybe it's various things like that. But that's the core of what I'm going to see. Now, a similar sort of thing happens with frequency, because imagine I have an input going in that is just sine omega t. Well, if I saw that, I would go, well, wait a minute, I know my I've got my you know, my output over my input is 1 over s tau. If I know it's a single frequency, then I might, and I know that I'm looking at a steady state response. Again, this is kind of a case where I'm looking at the transient, and I usually look at both. For a frequency response, I might be just looking for the steady state solution, which is going to be a sinusoid of, a, of that exact frequency that I'm putting in continuously on the input. We often talk about these questions as being the starting point of what we mean by frequency response. Okay, so in that particular case, I could then just say, let me look at the given frequency. Well, S is then just going to be, is going to be sigma plus j omega. I don't need the sigma part. I'll just use the j omega part and look at that given frequency. What I get then is then this response is a complex thing of one over j omega tau plus one. And that works great. And that gives me the sense of what does it look like for that sinusoid. And you go, well, so I know the frequency doesn't change, but I know that the amplitude changes and the phase change. Well, how does that change? Well, the amplitude is going to be the magnitude of whatever is going on here. Okay, so the magnitude of this, well, the magnitude of the magnitude of a complex number, remember, if I have it, is the magnitude of the numerator over the magnitude of the denominator. The magnitude of 1 is just 1. That's easy. The magnitude of 1 plus j omega tau is then going to give me a square root of 1 plus omega squared tau squared. Basically, sort of squaring... The, the real and the imaginary parts and taking a square root of it. Not too hard. And so that's the magnitude. Now the phase shift is going to be an inverse tanch of that particular structure. Now I'm in the denominator, so I'm going to get a negative sign in terms of the phase shift, kind of where that kicks in, and then I get a tau, uh, omega tau in that space. So what's really cool is that given this very one simple differential equation, I can pretty much look at all sorts of arbitrary inputs and these get looked at a number of different cases here, and not just find the solution, but also know that I really have a methodical way of finding these solutions.